was fired, he quickly put into motion the coup uh, plot. And to justify it, he alleged that his life uh, was under threat. And um, uh, to the extent there was a suggestion that uh, the threat also was from the military, it was preposterous because we know for a fact that the military assisted him to leave the country uh, and cross the border for dramatic effect. Uh, to the extent that the military was working with him uh, and they were um, uh, cooperating at the level of the command element, he could in fact have stayed in the country and, 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 and he would have been okay uh, under military uh, protection. But he left to give dramatic effect to a plot that was definitely activated the day uh, he was fired. He may have uh, reasonably, in quotation marks, been uh, concerned about elements of the police or the uh, Central Intelligence Organization doing this or that, but certainly not the, the army. In any event, as he was leaving, uh, he left movie style as he was leaving, saying, I will be back uh, in two weeks. Uh, it's common cause that he was back in two weeks. Uh, someone who's running away for dear life doesn't say I will be back in two weeks. Uh, so, 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 I, 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 I think to try and draw parallels between how he left and how we left uh, is an exercise in futility. Uh, Prof. Mwesh, let me just take you back to another incident as well. Uh, uh, as soon as uh, uh, the then uh, command, uh, Commander in Chief uh, General uh, Chiwenga uh, returned to Zimbabwe, uh, there are allegations or stories that uh, there was an attempt to arrest him, but the military came and managed to uh, help him escape uh, from, a, from a potential arrest. And there was a movie style drama uh, that really occurred at the airport there. Uh, your, your, your understanding towards this issue, uh, we seem to have a lot of this uh, news going on. Uh, can you confirm or deny exactly what may have happened? Was there any attempt to arrest Shiwenga by the time he came from China at the airport? And was it true that in, um, uh, in fact uh, the military came in and arrested him and they stopped the action? There is no basis for confirming or denying something that did not happen. Uh, but something that was created as a legend to justify the coup, to excite people, and was planted and put in a very leading newspaper and it is also captured in a book uh, two weeks in November, which is a, a fictitious account of, uh, of the coup. Uh, it didn't happen uh, and it has been emphatically denied and those who made it uh, or the claim uh, have never come out uh, uh, in the open, transparent to say so. These are accounts that have been planted in other people's heads and mouths and, 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 and publications. Uh, it's preposterous. What we know for a fact is that rather than arresting him, uh, the, 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 the late uh, former president wanted Chiwenga to become a member of the Politburo and a member of the government. Clearly, there were efforts to retire him. But retiring someone from the position of CDF and, and arresting someone, uh, you know, the difference is like of day and night. That was a, a fiction, which fiction, I'm afraid, we will not uh, even find uh, expression in any movie script so it's not even true that at the airport on that day there was drama and security personnel from the army are tried to save him from any potential attack no none he was received nicely and they left uh, with him and, uh, and 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 he already had a plan to put in place uh, they'd been talking and so forth that's why he arrives on the 12th 
and he gives a, a dramatic statement, press statement on the 13th, and he doesn't talk about him be, having been a target of arrest and asking him what was that about. Uh, he's talking about ZANU PF politics uh, and, 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 and individuals who must be uh, weeded out of ZANU PF. That coup was all about ZANU PF. He makes, they made uh, on that day uh, comments about people uh, in their party positions. And then when the coup happened and there was that meeting uh, he had with Mugabe, it had seven points. Five of those points were about ZANU PF. Uh, and the only complaint about uh, the military uh, related to their uh, to the security of China for the for the for the hierarchy for the top uh, echelons. Uh, so uh, and and you know the person who would have been responsible for wanting to arrest him would have been arrested the day of the coup himself. That is the former commissioner of police. Uh, the Commissioner General of Police, uh, Chihuri. He served that government for quite some months after that. And if he truly had meant to arrest Chiwenga, no doubt he would have been arrested. Of course, they had issues with him, but, but he served them. And, and we know for a fact, and, and I, 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 I detailed uh, this uh, account in Excel Gate, that um, Chihuri himself, sought explanations uh, from the chief secretary uh, uh, in the office of uh, the president and cabinet, Dr. Mishak Swander, to say, but we hear this, where is this coming from? And when he took them to task in a, a, a meeting where uh, both uh, the new president, Mnangagwa, and then uh, the new vice president, Wenga, were there, and the commissioner of police, uh, the commissioner general of police, uh, uh, then uh, uh, Augustine Chihuri raised this issue. Uh, all accounts confirmed is that uh, the people who should have either known or one who should have been the victim of the attempted uh, arrest looked at each other in amazement rather than in confirmation or explanation to say, where the hell is this coming from? Uh, uh, just out of interest, you mentioned that uh, there was a plan to retire uh, CDF uh, Chiwenga. Uh, do you have an idea of it, a, a timeline? Uh, around what time was this supposed to be happening? If you may help us understand. Uh, if um, there's a time when uh, uh, before the coup, the late uh, parents she left the country and went to dubai and was hiding there he was not even in the country during the coup if he had been in the country uh, and that would have been before the coup uh, around the time Mnangagwa gets uh, dismissed uh, parents she unfortunately of all people parents she uh, would have been made uh, the uh, CDF. Okay, interesting. interesting. And the only thing why he was not made CDF is that he was in Dubai. And then uh, uh, the fate that conspired against that plot was that he stayed in Dubai and um, uh, then uh, the serving CDF, uh, Chowenga, came back from China when this one was still in Dubai. Uh, if uh, um, this one had not gone to Dubai, he would have been made the CDF before Chiwenga came back from China. Uh -huh. So Chiwenga was going to be uh, literally dissolved while he was not yet in the country. And that time I know he was also much no, Chinese not, not dissolved. Uh, no, no one was going to dissolve Chiwenga. He was going to be retired. <laughs> At that time, uh, uh, how did you receive that message? We, we saw him marching with the Chinese soldiers uh, while he was in China during that time. Was that not a military uh, statement that he was sending home? 
Ah, well, but uh, he was a military man. Send what, what, what other sta military statement would you be sending when he was a military man? And yet, gone there is a military man, and what was happening was a military protocol. Okay. If 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 parents had not gone to Dubai, that military parade you saw would not have stopped parents being appointed to CGF. <laughs> interesting. Wow, uh, that's, that's, that's a very interesting uh, revelation there. Uh, does, does this say anything of the relationship between uh, Mnangagwa and, and, and Perens Shiri? Or you, you are just very close to both uh, his superiors, uh, your, your analysis towards this? Because it, it looked like he was favored by both establishments. Yeah, I, I don't think it says much about Perens Shiri, but a lot about uh, the late former President Mgabe. Mm -hmm. And 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 in the end, um, from an analytical point of view, I would say uh, part of what it says about the late uh, president, uh, former president, is that um, uh, he, he he invested and put his trust in the wrong people. I think his judgment as who to trust, perhaps uh, there may be other issues as well, but certainly on this score, was uh, misplaced in a big way. Uh, and this, this is what happened uh, and was happening gradually and, uh, until we then saw these uh, very inconsistent developments in the end, including moving Bonyongwe uh, from uh, uh, security um, at the 11th hour and, 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 and bringing him to justice uh, might have uh, guaranteed uh, a, a, a non-response to the coup. It would have been interesting if the coup had happened when Bonyongwe was still the director general at CIO. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact that uh, there was no longer serious leadership, you had Nepera there, uh, who had been associated with the coup, uh, 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 meant that uh, the, 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 the opportunity for the coup to 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 happen with uh, uh, little to zero security response, uh, you know, it just grew. The, the opportunity was very ripe. Uh, uh, extremely uh, knowledgeable uh, to all this happening, and uh, you you had all the red lights going on. Uh, what what was going on in the president's mind during all this time? Because surely it seems inevitable, but uh, we 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 really not seeing an aggressive. Uh, turn around towards this. What what was going on in his mind? Uh, but I'm making that point that he trusted his uh, uh, his boys. These were his boys. I I I, I uh, we, we, this is a, a kind of a labyrinth of uh, complicated threads. Uh, but uh, you know they have a history. I would say. Uh, from 2006, from the Goromonzi fiasco, uh, when people like Simba Makoni and others started saying, when they were pushing for succession and they were being told that there is no vacancy, and they were saying, well, if there is no vacancy, we are going to create it. Uh, and they pushed for a, an extraordinary Congress uh, in 2007 uh, and it didn't lead to the outcome they were hoping for it had been poorly planned and then we have the 2008 election and we have bora musangu i mean <laughs> what caused them to lose the 2008 election was of course bora musangu and then it's it, that bora musangu uh was uh, linked to the late uh, uh, retired uh, General Solomon Mujuru and his wife. Uh, uh, 
when I think, and, and, and we leave this to scholarship to try and uh, unpack uh, 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 properly, but I think when President Mugabe lost the confidence of the late general, and when he, President Mugabe, lost confidence in the late general, things fell apart. He became open for the taking. That what uh, for as long as President Mugabe maintained that relationship he had with Solomon Mjuri throughout his period of reign until 2006. During that period, he, he, he was reasonably secure. But after that period from 2008, but it started, the cracks started widening in 2006. Uh, by 2008, he was now floating. Uh, he had lost confidence in Mjuru. Mjuru had lost confidence in him. And, and, and these guys came to say, but the chef, we are with you, when they were not with him because he should have been succeeded by then. And I think that if um, a vice president, uh, then vice president uh, uh, Joyce Mjuru had played her cards well, and she almost did, and she had uh, quite a formidable force from the police and from the central intelligence. Um, on any other day, she would have succeeded. But by 20, 2014, going into the Congress, the way they handled the run-up to that Congress uh, with uh, Didima Sumtasa as a security minister uh, uh, was very clumsy. Uh, uh, and, 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 and the military intelligence took over uh, and the stories that they created and fed the system, and by the system, uh, it will be all the organs, including, for example, the information organs, and, and, and I was Minister of Information at the time. The, we were actually fed uh, with information that alarmed us, genuinely alarmed us. That instead of uh, a political succession process, uh, a, a, an assassination was was underway, including an assassination of other politicians, such as myself. You know, in 2014, some of us were living in fear because we we had been told that there were some uh, snipers that had come and uh, uh, were being targeted and so forth. I mean, it was a, it was a bizarre situation. Uh, I know. I have a colleague who says to me, uh, you like referring to untold stories. Well, yes, because there are a lot of untold stories. And one of the untold stories is about uh, the insecurities that we generated uh, uh, in uh, 2014. Uh, uh, going into the Congress. It was just unbelievable, really, really unbelievable. And it's a, it's a pity that some of the people who are involved or were involved uh, are the type that never write books, but I hope that uh, others who write books uh, will talk to them. Because m much as you might have heard me saying this and that in 2014, I was actually living in fear that there were people who had come from outside the country to assassinate us. How real was the threat? Uh, was, was it not imaginary? Well, but I mean, you can't ask me this because uh, I'm not a security person. Now, if security people tell me that we are monitoring certain people who are here, uh, marksmen who are here to kill you uh, on behalf of uh, Joyce Mujuru and company who want to take over, it's very difficult for you in real time to say, 
ah, but you know, you're bluffing, get out of here, what do you like? You, you begin to think, but what the hell is this? Mm -hmm. And you know, there were stories, and some of them were published, uh, to the effect that uh, uh, Comrade Goche had uh, brought uh, uh, snipers from, from Israel and so forth to take out the president, uh, and they wanted to do a Kabila on him, and some of the conversations linked to Comrade uh, to Gare Gumbo uh, and so forth. Uh, it was a very crazy situation. One thing I think we can say in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, with hindsight is that clearly it was an, okay, an orchestration to create a, a basis that was effectively used to get Mjuru and the entire political supporters out of the way. Uh, let me just take you back uh, in the same period, uh, the Boram Sango uh, period where you are right now, uh, where many people uh, then voted for the ZANU PF MPs and uh, did not want to vote or did not vote for, for, for a presidential uh, election there. Uh, the, the, the event going on at, at, at that time, um, how, how was that practical for, for an MP then to, to send such a message? If, if Boram Sango was the real reason, how easy was it for an MP to win votes and then allows uh, the same constituency to then vote against uh, an MDC candidate? Uh, practically, how, how, how was that achievable? Uh, first of all, Mm, uh, for whatever it's worth, uh, I, I wasn't in ZANPF during that period myself. Uh, I was uh, an independent uh, in 2008. Um, uh, and I, I, I therefore can't, can't answer it as a ZANPF insider uh, because I was not. However, I, you know, it's a small political uh, place, so. I was interacting with uh, ZANU PF uh, MPs, uh, uh, and from a, a, a political analytical point of view, uh, one can answer the question: How easy was it? Well, going by the results that then we saw after that election, uh, it took almost four months to announce the presidential result and then when it came uh, allegations were made that um, none of the candidates had uh, gotten 50 percent plus one vote it was clearly a cooked result uh, uh, therefore suggesting that it was easy uh, and that's why they couldn't announce the result and you know the uh, Zek people started lying that they had to do recounts and, they, and, and, and then they say they recounted you know uh, uh, last week uh, 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 Mlanga, blessed Mlanga and maybe this uh, heart and soul tv they, they replayed this interview with uh, kazembe Joyce Kazembe was a, a commissioner saying, oh, we, we had to recount. I mean, re recount the entire presidential election. Uh, it didn't explain who, who asked for the recount uh, or what it cost uh, uh, the recount. And um, the election um, was on the 29th of March, I think, that year. Yeah. And the results, at most, would be counted in five days. Why did the recount take months? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of uh, unintelligible things that were being alleged. Uh, but it, the totality of the evidence is that it was easy to do Boram Sango to, as the result showed. But on the other hand, we can't say it was easy uh, uh, in that Mgabe lost, but the Member of Parliament won 
Because we know that the MDC, the two MDCs combined, they got 110 seats out of 210. <coughs> so, they, so, so, so Europe is done with lost both. <laughs> they, they lost parliament and lost the presidential election. So the Boram Sango was the boomerang uh, strategy. It really just uh, put everything topsy turvy and uh, 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 the disintegration started. Uh, I don't think it was easy to say we just vote for the MP and we don't vote for Mugabe because in the end, both the MP and Mugabe lost. In the end, yeah. I, I, I think I, I think that's a that, that's a better explanation there because I've never been a believer of that whole Boram Sango thing, uh, except mm -hmm. that they, they results themselves. They never they never sounded authentic. Uh, that that moves mm -hmm. us uh, to the to the to the purpose. One hour uh, forty minutes later of this interview, uh, where we need to try and understand uh, the role that uh, uh, plays played and child play in the next up, uh, upcoming elections. Uh, Prof Moyo, at, at that moment, if Zeg could be controlled to delay and recount uh, results without anyone requesting that, uh, how authentic is a system or an establishment like Zeg? is it for it to produce an authentic and credible election in a country like Zimbabwe? Uh... I think to make a, 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 a long story short, uh, the tragedy of electoral politics in Zimbabwe is that since the day one, from the beginning, Zimbabwe has never had an electoral body with the capacity integrity, credibility to run free and fair elections. That every election from day one in 1980 has had a military securocratic component to determine the winner for one reason or another the first reason in 1980 having been to end the war. You see, if you run an election with an objective of ending the war and purportedly to bring about peace, uh, you make a false start. Because any election that is conducted organized to end the, the a war will look the other way will justify practices that are inconsistent with a free and fair election under the guise of ending the war you know you say it's more important to end the war so while we realize that this is wrong or those guys have not won, let's do it that way and this way because it will end the war, not because it will produce the will of the people. So there was a false start right from the beginning. And the fact that this false start was done in the context of a state of emergence where certain uh, rights can be suspended, arbitrary suspension of his rights, was just uh, unfortunate. Uh, that false start was then entrenched, developed. Uh, the 1985 election was worse. Not only was it done during Gugurawundi, the height of it, but I repeat, during a state of emergency. Now, can you imagine uh, 1980, 1985, 1993 elections run under conditions of war in the state of emergency? The state of emergency that was uh, in, uh, in uh, adopted 64, 65 was 
uh, repealed in July of 1990. How can a country that... Uh, uh, so if the Rhodesian uh, state was for 15 years under a state of emergency, the state of emergency itself, which was the bedrock of the Rhodesian state, the UDI, was in Zimbabwe for 25 years, 10 years during the independence years. And I honestly don't think it is reasonable for anyone to expect a country whose first decade of Uhuru, all of the decade, was under a state of emergency to have put in the kind of background or a foundation that would uh, uh, lead to uh, a free, a fair elections. Uh, and, and during that time, the elections were being run by the Registrar General under some loose thing that would come to life only during the elections called the Election Directorate made entirely of uh, state people and that election directorate was supervised by some useless thing called election or electoral supervisory commission famously led by kamba professor kamba can you imagine mm. and then out of the ashes of the electoral supervisory commission and uh, election directorate run by the Register General, unaccountable to the incumbents, and uh, uh, impervious to any uh, 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 scrutiny uh, or, or, or uh, accountability, was born Zek. And Zek, born uh, initially really as just a, a transfer of people who were doing uh, elections under the uh, auspices of the election directorate, who are there for bureaucrats, who are there for sewn into secrets, made the critical core of Zek. So it did not uh, create problems that you could get people uh, seconded from the army uh, to become critical officers uh, to the point of uh, becoming uh, chief election officers uh, and the chairman of ZEC, if you want chairperson. Then when that changes, and ZEC becomes a constitutional body created in 2013 as an independent commission, or one of the independent commissions. It's only the law that changed, but not the practice. The practice is that those guys who had come from the army, from the, from the security st uh, 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 structure, uh, have been running uh, elections in Zimbabwe all those years, uh, become, became comfortable. ZEC becomes an independent Chapter 12 commission in 2013, but its critical players go back to the years before. 2008. I mean, one of the most critical persons in charge of operations uh, and the logistics, uh, Mavis uh, Matanga, uh, an active serving CIO person, put there in 2008, and now very experienced, uh, sits and uh, there, you know, no scrutiny. Nobody said, okay, now that Zeke is a, 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 a chapter 12 independent commission, what do we do? Yeah. Not only in terms of his bureaucracy, but also in terms of the commissioners. There wasn't really that. Mm. Because an election is a rule-bound process, which is uh, essentially 
uh, legal in, in, in content. Uh, you change the law, but you don't change the baggage. These guys run the election. Uh, you then get what we, 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 we have. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, Zek, right from the beginning, and unfortunately, especially after the adoption of the new constitution, where the commission, I mean, the, where Zek becomes an independent uh, commission uh, established in terms of uh, section 235 of the constitution, uh, has not gone through the appropriate transformation consistent with its new constitutional mandate. Uh, and, 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 and the rest is history. Hmm. Uh, Prof, uh, in, interesting development there. I, we, we, we need to understand. I know uh, uh, part, part of uh, uh, creation of, of ZEC as, as the 12 chapters as well. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a constitutional obligation. Uh, in, in such a country where you are having a continuous conflict, how then do you come out, or how rather would you suggest that Zimbabwe can come out with a fair and credible uh, ZEC? How should ZEC be comprised if at all in Zimbabwe we are going to be having a fair and free elections, what what needs to be done? I know this is a constitutional, uh, it's a constitutional creature. Uh, it's part of the twelve chapters. But how do you suggest that uh, players have uh, equal or fair representation as far as the uh, creation of ZEC is concerned? And what can be done, at, especially towards the creation of an animal called ZEC, if we have fair and, and, and fair elections? Ah, uh, well, they, they, look. Uh, I think the basic question is, when you have the right legal framework, as we do in terms of both the constitutional provisions and the electoral act, when, by and large, the constitution provides for the conduct of free, fair, trans trans uh, 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 transparent, and efficient elections conducted by an independent electoral body that is not accountable to any authority or controlled by any authority. When the law does that, and then the incumbents are not fit for purpose what do you do in my view i don't think you come up with more laws in my view you mobilize society and use the constitution and the electoral uh, law for society to produce a vigilant electorate, which number one, registers to vote in unprecedented historic numbers. And number two, votes in unprecedented historic numbers, numbers on the voting day. Number three, takes unprecedented historic measures to protect the vote and, and uses the protection of the vote in terms of the law to make it impossible for any authority to subvert the will of the people. we needed the law to be progressive and now it is the next step is to make the practice progressive and to make the practice of, of, of uh, 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 progressive is requires two things one exactly what i've been saying to make it impossible for Zeki people to deviate from the law by voting, first by registering in huge numbers, voting in huge numbers, and protect your vote in huge numbers. Now, 
Secondly, you need to bring two processes in Zimbabwe together. One process is people who form themselves into political parties or who are candidates for political office. These people need to be competent. No one should seek political power when they are not ready for it. If you present yourself as a political party or as a candidate for public office, but you lack the competence to use the law to protect your pursuit, you are wrong. You should not be there. No political party should put a presidential candidate when they know that the presidential candidate will be contesting in 10,985 polling stations and doesn't put polling agents in half of those polling stations or even in 500 of those polling stations. If you seek the presidential candidate and you don't have a, a polling agents who are competent, vigilant, and incorruptible, whom we ensure that they follow every ballot in every polling station. You must not seek office. If you seek office, presidential office, without that capacity, you are giving hostage to fortune. You are an enabler of election rigging. Because the system will use you as it did in, nine, uh, in 2018, that, hey, there were 23 candidates. You see how democratic we are. Please check how many of those 23 candidates had four polling agents to protect and safeguard the presidential result of that candidate in every polling station. How many of those 23? Maduku likes making noise and creating a lot of nonsense. He was a presidential candidate. Can he tell us how many polling agents he had? Out of 10,985 polling stations. And as he tells us, he must know we are students of electoral politics, we know. The fact that he did not have the, he did not fulfill the requisite uh, uh, the minimum requisite behaviors, number of uh, polling agents means that he was enabling rigging, he was escorting Mnangagwa. Angarim perekets we guba wa Mnangagwa. And this is very wrong. When you have the, those kinds of candidates, it, because Mnangagwa went to CNN, BBC, and said, unlike, for the first time, unlike the previous regime, when yeah. we used to have two, three, minimum, maximum four candidates, this time we have 23. The new dispensation has made it possible to have 23 candidates. 23 useless candidates, there was only one candidate there who had uh, some high number, uh, Nelson Chamisa, but unfortunately, even him, he didn't have an uh, uh, election uh, um, uh, uh, polling uh, across, the across the country. He didn't. When you don't have uh, enough, or, and enough is covering all of the uh, now, uh, polling stations, because we have a polling yeah. station. If you don't, you are enabling a rigging and you have no basis for saying the election has been stolen from you. Because how do you know what happened in those polling stations where you were not there? You were not there. Yeah, you didn't yeah. have representation there. Yeah. Yes. Why are you, uh, uh, you know, can you imagine the beauty of an argument being made by someone who is in all the 10,985, next time there will be probably more, maybe 11,000 or so. But if you are there with four of your people and you have the results yourself, you can't be cheated and whoever cheats you 
the results will speak to the, uh, for themselves and inspire people in their homes and in the streets to say, we are as mad as hell and we are not going to take it anymore. It's very difficult for people who doubt whether they have actually been cheated or not to go to the streets to defend what is theirs. They say, oh no, you're lying, oh, you're, you're politicking and so forth. So, uh, where the law is progressive, as I believe in Zimbabwe, electoral law is one of the most progressive laws in the region. You can't protect the vote simply by that law. The law is there to protect those who protect themselves. And those who protect themselves fulfill all the requirements of the law and make it difficult for the system to cheat. Because while the Zimbabwean uh, system is prone to cheating, one of the most important uh, contributions of the MDC to the democratic uh, uh, development of the state in Zimbabwe is to make it difficult for ZANU-PF to come up with the undemocratic electoral law. We don't have laws that require undemocratic practices when it comes to elections. And that is one of the most important uh, uh, achievements that the MDC must be proud of, the collective MDC. Voters used to be so afraid and used to believe the propaganda that when you are there in the booth uh, alone, we can see how you are voting. No voter in Zimbabwe believes that anymore. And, 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 and remember, we used to have a, a constituency-based voters role, which right. meant in the whole constituency, you can vote in any polling station. And they used to, you go to the polling station, you give the card, they cancel your name, they see whether there's ink. So people used to invest a lot of nonsense to try and uh, remove the ink. So yeah, that they vote the next polling sessions. In nomadic voters, you know. They just ch then, change polling then sessions. Then yeah. they pound on that, pound on that, and the result was we got a what best voters role. But still, even within the ward, there were many polling stations there, and the people try and play nonsense. They said, no, let's get rid of this. Let's have a polling station based voters role. So that you basically have to be vote, I mean, registered to vote uh, within the proximity of, of your resident. I mean, this is uh, uh, an expression of uh, democracy in action. And, and, and you know, if you are involved in the struggle for democratizing the space and the state, and you make some inroads, you must celebrate your victories, deepen them, and say, this is what we have uh, achieved. What is the next chapter? Now, the next chapter is to defend the vote, and it has to be defended by the candidates. You know what? I, 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 uh, I have to say, I know as a former ZANU PF that um, the incapacity of candidates and political parties to defend their vote is across the board. Even ZANU-PF can't defend its vote. ZANU-PF candidates struggle to have election agents. MP candidates, even within the ward, the local authority candidates, they struggle also. The difference is that ZANU-PF relies on the CIO and the police to be everywhere. In fact, ele election, uh, 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 or rather polling agents, 
for ZANU-PF candidates, the money for that uh, comes from the CIO. And then they, so they, they will uh, support some of the candidates, I mean, the uh, polling agents that are deployed by the candidates or by ZANU-PF itself, but the money also covers the CIO ones. So they make sure that they are at every polling station, you know. Now, if you have an opponent who is relying on state resources and you really want to change, you've got to prepare your base to understand what they are up against. And when it comes to elections the world over, you don't necessarily have to pay for the manpower for everything. Because the other party is not paying for the manpower. It is using your taxpayer dollars to give the ruling party an advantage. So what do you do? Please start today to develop a serious cohort cadres, voluntary cadres. That is what wins the votes for opposition parties around the world, in the democratic world. Volunteers. But you can't, you can't get volunteers overnight. So you develop volunteers who will assist you to mobilize for voter registration, you develop volunteers who will mobilize to become your, your polling agents. Volunteers for change. Volunteers for democracy. And all they need to do is to volunteer maximum for the presidential election, five days. For the parliamentary election, two days. For the local authority election, one day. You develop a system. How many volunteers, you know, in a, a country with uh, 15 million people, uh, the majority who are young, you can't fail if you are a serious party to get even 100,000 volunteers. But here we need 50,000. If you can't get 50,000 volunteers, you have a problem. If you can't get 50,000 volunteers and you are a political party that wants to seize power, tell yourself you have a problem. Especially now. Why is it, you know, you can get volunteers who are teachers within Zimbabwe, and, and, and you groom them over time and so forth quietly so that they are the basis for your defense of the vote using the law which is progressive in your favor. Do you know, um, the one thing that uh, really I find uh, crushing or I have found crushing is that the, uh, among the other features of the progressive electoral law in Zimbabwe, the results, Zimbabwe is uh, five electoral centers. And section 37C uh, of the Electoral Act uh, provides for how results are transmitted between the five centers and to five to the five centers, like how you start from one to the other, to the other, to the other. One of the progressive features of that, which you find from section 64, uh, you find in section 64, section 65, section 65A and section, section 65B of the Electoral Act is that each one of these five centers must post the, the result of the election uh, outside the polling station. So you, uh, I mean, outside this, the center. So you start with the polling station. It must post the result outside each polling station. So uh, on election night, 
who after the polling stations uh, have closed at 7 p.m. and everyone who was uh, at the queue has been given the opportunity to vote and then the vote is done and the counting is done, each of the 10,985 polling stations must put the result out. Now, if you are a credible opposition, it means you have 10,985 V11s with the result. And if you are an organized uh, uh, opposition, you should get each one of those results sent to you. And you should have an app that then puts them together and adds the 10,985 for the presidential election and tells you uh, uh, who has won because it is the result of all the candidates. That's one center. The next center is the word center. You go to the word center and there are 1,985 collation centers which bring all the polling uh, uh, station returns, the V11s. And when they are done, they also put their result outside. So you have 1,985 results of your presidential election in uh, uh, posted outside. You add 1,985, you know who has gotten what, because you get your guys to send it to you. And these uh, word return, election returns, which are called V23As, are sent to the constituency center. And when you are at the constituency center and you have finished, and the V23As uh, uh, that have come from what have been added together, you have 210. Just 210, by the way, V23Bs for the whole country, which are posted outside. Those, uh, your people should get those uh, V23Bs, for goodness sake. Add yeah. them together and tell you what the result is. Uh, why, why would you fail to add 210 V23Bs alone? Mm -hmm. And when they are done with these V23Bs, the next center is the provincial center. They take 210 to the uh, each one to its province. And they count. Then you get 10 V23Cs, which if you add these 10, you have the result of the presidential election. Yeah, these are the provinces. Yeah. Yes. And they take the, pres the provinces, the V23Cs, to the National Command Center. They add them and you have one V23D, just one. Before they announce you, when you are counting there, you, the, the, uh, the, uh, the election agent, you have it. So your party, if it is competent, has five centers with results. It is the polling stations, 10,985. It is the ward collation centers, 1,958. It is the uh, constituency, returns 210, 210 it, is, yeah. it is the province 10 and it is the national command center five each one of these should add to the same number right even before zek announces mm -hmm. but do you know what i've been crushed as i've been saying you know the candidates they wait i can understand why my book waits and I can understand why Togo, Kope Way, and all these others, because they don't have polling agents there. So they don't know. They will be like waiting for Zeki to tell them. No credible result. political party <laughs> has to wait for Zeki to tell them. Mm -hmm. You have the results. The law enables you to do that. And when they say don't, can, don't announce it, it will yeah. take what a stupid is the legal Sorry? So in other words, what is illegal is the announcing of the results, not for you to get the results. Yeah, but it's nonsense. No, but, uh, but I, I, would, I would say I'm not announcing the result, but I can tell you, I can tell my parties that we have received all our reports from our uh, polling agents, and this is what they've reported us. Right. And you know, uh, you can't lose an election in that kind of a situation unless you are really losing. Because why empower Zek? And, and you want them to announce, can you imagine, do we really need someone tomorrow morning to announce that uh, uh, today 
is uh, July 22. I mean, sorry, uh, today is June 22. Great, yeah. Do we need anyone to announce to us that tomorrow is June 22? No. Oh, today is yeah. June 21. Yesterday was. No, it's a fact. Uh, a that we, fact. We, we arrive at. And, and the process of the law leads you to facts that must become indisputable. And where there are disputes, they will be very grounded. But that has to do with the political parties. In my opinion, in uh, still in uh, uh, pursuit to the question you, you raised, how do we uh, make sure we do You know what? You can't have democracy in a society that does not make it its business to have democracy. In a society which makes it appear like the responsibility of democracy is on this individual, that individual, and so forth. No, when you find yourself in a society where people say, oh, we are in this situation because of so and so and so and so, that is absolutely nonsense. Can you imagine what would happen in America if the absence of democracy were to be put on the shoulders of individuals? Yeah. Uh, though, uh, can you imagine what uh, Trump would have done?